Thank you. Well, I get, I get the, the lucky last slot before lunchtime, so you're all really keen to go and uh, have a bit of a munch and ask some, some exciting questions out there. But um, I'm here to talk about um, small companies, so from global now down to small companies in Australia, um, and specifically about this very emerging companies, which is a listed investment company, um, which seeks to replicate the Australian Small Companies Fund that uh, we manage at Sferia. So what I plan to do today is run you through a bit about what uh, Sferia does and how we invest money, what the um, LIC uh, seeks to replicate, um, and why I think the actual LIC right now is a pretty good opportunity if, uh, if you're interested in yield and exposure to small companies. First of all, what is the SEC? It's basically a listed version of the Australian Small Companies Fund that we run at Sferia. There's a couple of things that I think we do differently from some of our peers and small companies. Firstly, we focus on risk first. Now, a lot of fund managers are out there trying to smack the ball out of the park and find um, you know, three, four, five bagger stocks that will give you incredible returns. Um, I guess Matt and myself, the co-founders of Sferia, really start with the philosophy of how do we control risk? Um, you know, we know we're fishing in a smaller pond, so micro caps and smaller caps, uh, where risk is inherently higher. They're not as diversified as large companies, not global in many cases. Um, and they're more exposed in some cases to economic cycles. So how do we counter that with risk control? So what we look for firstly is stocks that make good cash flow, or well, stocks are very cash generative. And one of our core processes is to examine how the accounting earnings of a company transfers into cash flow. And that might sound pretty obvious, accounting earnings should be cash flow, but in many, many cases, especially small companies, the cash flow conversion is actually pretty bad. So we look for companies that have a high cash flow conversion rate. Secondly, we like companies that are not heavily geared. That is, they haven't got lots of debt in the balance sheet. Why is that? When times get tough um, and companies struggle, uh, if you're reliant on banks or reliant on the stock market being open to raise capital, as many of the finance companies are, for example, in the small company space, they come back to shareholders at the worst possible time during you know, credit crunches and say, we'd like some more cash. Um, what does that do to the share price of those particular companies? completely incinerates them, as you can imagine, and, and you end up doing placements at record discounts to the current share price. So you get really, really bad outcomes as investors. So we like companies that have low gearing. And then finally, we do believe um, the valuations are important, and we'll come into that a bit later on, but we use a, effectively a, ca a cash flow valuation or discounted cash flow valuation to value our stocks. All the stocks in our portfolios are modeled by the analysts and the team, um, and we only buy stocks where we see decent upside to fair value. Uh, we typically have a, a range of 20 to 65 stocks. At the moment, there's about 35 stocks, so you are getting a breadth of exposure to small companies when you buy the LIC. And um, we have paid dividends consistently since we IPO the company about 18 months ago. Every six months, there's a, there's a dividend. At the moment, it's on about a 3.5% fully frank dividend yield looking backwards. So looking forward, that's actually probably more perspective again. It's probably 3.7, 3.8 if you look forward. So I was being asked to talk about small companies and a few of the trends we've seen in small companies and how that reflects what we're doing and how we think as investors. Now this chart here is, um, is a sort of stylized chart. What's it, what's it, what it's trying to show you is the biggest thematic we've seen has been that very low interest rate um, and what that's done to investors. And there's been two thematics playing out in the small company space in the last really 18 months, two years. The first has been um, a massive shift away from active managers like ourselves to quant, quant strategies where you have computers effectively buying, um, you know, buying stocks based on a variety of quant metrics that appear to be working. They're backward looking right now, things like earnings momentum, revenue momentum, other things that are really driving those quant machines. And you've also seen a massive inflow into passive investing. What's passive investing? That's where, again, a machine just buys the index. Um, and you win basically based on size. If you're a big index weight, you get more money from an index fund. If you're a small index weight, you get less money. That's all it is, it just buys on the size. Those two trends has seen a phenomenal re-rating in the most expensive stocks. So the stocks on the highest PE ratio going back a year have seen that incredible red line re-rating versus the rest of the market in the small cap space. So the 20% that are the highest rated stocks saw an incredible re-rate in the last 12, 18 months. Um, basically when a PE goes up, obviously, um, market expects your earnings to accelerate. Um, so what we're saying is the share price is going up a lot faster than your earnings are growing which typically happens when markets go into a bit of a bubble kind of territory. But the rest of the market, coincidentally, um, has been left behind. And that's actually where we're finding, frankly, a lot of good opportunities. Another sort of pictorial example of how that's manifest is, is this, um, this basket here showing the WAX stocks. Many of you would have heard of the term WAX. Um, it stands for five stocks that have been kind of like the nifty 50 going back to the 70s or you know the go-go stocks that have existed historically where people have just piled into stocks if they've got a very similar thematic. Now the WAX stocks, uh, technology or fintech stocks, uh, things like WiseTech, 
um, Altium, Appen, Afterpay, you'd, you'd know many of these names. Now, we're not saying they're not great businesses, some are phenomenal companies. Um, I'd like to buy WiseTech if, if it was pro appropriately priced, but I think it's on an incredibly high multiple. If you take the combined earnings of those five names, uh, you have an earnings or a pre-tax earnings number of about 300, 300 odd million dollars with those companies there, and yet the market capitalization of that, that uh, coterie of five stocks is close to $35 billion. You're paying over 100 times EBIT, about 110 times EBIT for that basket of stocks, which is eye-watering, frankly. Um, now, they're good companies, but we don't think that that well valued. Uh, conversely, uh, we own a basket of stocks which comprise these sort of names here. You'll see, see here, so you'll, many of you will know Breville, um, City Chic, which is an example i come on to as a, as a retailer, Beacon Lighting. Um, so real companies have been around for a long period of time. Um, where collectively their, their aggregate EBIT is about the same as what the WAC stocks are earning, and yet the, the total market value of those stocks is $4 billion. Um, so you're paying about 14 times EBIT for a much better mix of stocks, we think, and certainly safer bet. Just quickly, how we've, um, the, the other thematic we've seen is with that money flowing up to, um, into passive and into quant funds, we saw the microcaps, that is stocks with market capitalizations under $500 million, we call that area the microcaps, we saw that, that's the green line there, really lag um, the smaller companies index over the last 12, actually that's back to January of last year, so it's almost 18 months now, 19 months. Um, and we, we, we had a presentation previously saying there's a real opportunity in the microcap space now to, to put money to work because they've lagged so, so deeply. But you'll see that gap has closed up. Um, a number of reasons for that, you've seen a bit of a speculative money flowing down into microcaps, and you've seen um, a number of takeovers down in the microcaps, which is starting to get, as corporates and foreign companies see the valuation differential between smalls and micros, they've gone into the micros and have been acquiring, acquiring stocks. Um, about six months ago, we tilted our portfolio slightly more microcap. Um, someone said to me, are you changing a strategy at what you do at Sphere? And we're like, no, we don't. Um, but we just saw better valuations, so we just skewed the portfolio a little bit more down to microcaps. This has been the performance of the, of the funds since we IPO'd the company. Now, more recently, you can see um, there's a very interesting shift in the market in the last month or two, where um, a lot of the momentum we, I discussed, that all the money flowing to the, the high value stocks, had a bit of a reversal. Um, I think, frankly, there's a couple of reasons for that. Many of you will, will have heard the term unicorn. Um, does anyone, anyone here know what a unicorn is? Yep. Yep. Um, or they, my kids think they're real, but um, <laughs> they don't actually exist, obviously. Uh, but apart from being a horse with a horn, it's also a, um, it's also a billion dollar valuation for a company that's not, li not, the, not the other company, not, not floated. So it's a small company that's, IP that's before IPO, that's got a massive valuation, basically. Now, the market's been proliferating with unicorns in the US, and there's been a couple in Australia. Um, and money's flowed into that from private equity. Um, and basically, that's seen a, a real sort of bubbling up of the whole, the whole circuit of these things. Over the last month or two, you've seen WeWork, for example, a very large um, potential unicorn in the US that was likely to IPO fail, so the IPO was, has been cancelled. Um, and that's had a bit of a flow-on effect into a whole lot of other valuations that people were assuming would, be, would you know, come down the pipeline and eventually IPO. Anyway, that's seen a bit of a reversal, a bit of a rethink, I think, from the marketplace. So there's been a bit of a tilt back to valuation, and we've done a really, well, had a really good month last month, but obviously since we IPO'd, um, the fund's up 6% compound, and the market's down 7 so we've slightly lagged the market over that period of time. But I think we'll catch up with that. And the history of our firm is superior, is very long-term long -term numbers that are way above the marketplace. Um, this just gives you a bit of a trajectory again of, of how we perform versus the market. Now, it's a very complicated line, so I apologize for that. I really just want to show you, um, do I have a laser beam here? No, I don't. Um, basically, I do have a laser. Oh, there it is, yeah. Just really just showing you how we, you know, given we buy stocks that we think are lower risk, so good cash flow, good valuation, lot of good balance sheets, we tend to do better when there are tough times in the marketplace. So in that sell-off we saw, um, because back in 2018, um, obviously we came back with the marketplace, but we significantly outperformed the marketplace because of the valuation discipline we have with what we're looking for. So we tend to keep up with the market when it's running pretty hard, but if it sells off aggressively, we tend to do better in the marketplace because of that focus on values, low gear balance sheets, and cash flow. Now, talk a bit more about drilling into numbers and give you a couple of stock examples of stocks we like and, and why we like them. Um, this, is, um, these are, this is a really good contrast, I think, between a share we would own and a share we wouldn't own. The one on the left-hand side is a company called Surtex Medical, uh, which used to do, uh, which does cancer treatment. So it does little spheres that people inject into the bloodstream that go and attack the cancer and, and hopefully kill off mainly around liver cancer treatment. 
Um, and what those two bars, well, that stream of bars there is showing you is how over time that stock's cash flow and earnings have, have compared. And I remember I mentioned, mentioned to you before that cash flow conversion is key to how we think. Um, and the average of that company over a long period of time is about 75 to 80%. So in other words, the earnings that are reported in, in, in the accounting point of view did translate into cash flows. Um, whereas on the right-hand side, you can see another biomedical stock called Mesoblast that you might have come across. Um, it, it's a, a massive business that does a lot of R&D, chews up a lot of cash flow to try and find um, some cures, uh, and so far hasn't actually produced any earnings at all. But at the time we bought Certex, um, it had roughly the same market capitalization as Mesoblast. And I think that's just a very good pictorial of stock we would own. We eventually, uh, Certex was eventually taken over by a Chinese company called CDH at a significant premium. So we bought into it when it was going through a period of um, tough times. CEO was resigned, there was a new guy coming in. Uh, the drug had, had not been expanded to new areas in the market, and the, and the stock got, got pretty badly sold off. But we saw a great business, good and long, you know, growth business, good cash, co cash conversion, and a net cash balance sheet. Another stock that we've, um, we've owned in the fund that um, has also been taken over, coincidentally, is a stock called GBST. And um, this is really what can happen to micro caps as well, micros and small caps. You can see the history there again, that, that, that bar, that I that those bars I showed on the left-hand side, might be a little bit dull to you guys, but it's important for us because we go back and look at the entire history. We don't look at three years. So many of our peers look at the last two or three years. We actually download the entire history of a company since it IPO'd and say, what's it done over a really long period of time, over multiple business cycles? And that gives you a much clearer understanding of how business will, you know, will, will generate cash. And you can see that company um, from the time it IPO'd has a 90% cash flow conversion, which is very good. Uh, this stock had a, um, a period of underinvesting in its IT and the new management team came in and said, we need to take some money out and invest heavily back in the IT, which is the right long-term call to do. Unfortunately, no one likes seeing CapEx go out the door and no immediate uh, returns to, in the earnings, so the share price was under significant pressure. Um, so we, we bought, started buying stock around $2. It got absolutely incinerated <laughs> at the beginning of this year, and you can see that, that share price on the, on the right-hand side there. Um, we entered around two. It continue, continues to decline, even though the revenue growth quite was okay. Um, there was no cash flow because they're putting it back into the capex to kind of capex catch up on the on the IT, but we were seeing you know good prospects coming through. They were winning new new clients despite the fact they were putting the money back into the base, um, and that stock has received multiple bidders. So uh, Bravura kicked off the race, then a US company called SS and C came in and bid a higher price, and finally First NZ, which works in a similar field to um, GBST, um, came through and paid the highest price. So that stock's now three dollars eighty five plus we get a franking credit. So that gives you some idea of. What can happen if you're, if you're patient in the small cap space? Um, the balance sheet was net cash. History of cash flow conversion was very good and the valuation was attractive. We just had to be a bit, bit more patient in the marketplace and, and buying that stock. Another good example is, um, and this is really, I think, one thing that we're kind of proud of, is the team tries to keep an open mind. So with large companies, so um, you saw an example previously from LVMH. It's, been, it's, a, it's a cracking business, been around for a very long period of time, but they evolve slowly. Like they're massive companies. Um, you know, it's like trying to change the direction of the Titanic. You know, you grab the wheel, you turn left, and 25 miles you turn a couple of degrees left. I mean, small companies conversely can change very quickly based on changes in management team, um, changes in outlook. And um, City Chic was actually part of a group called Specialty Fashion, SFH, which was um, a listed retail with about five or six brands that were mostly struggling. In that was, was City Chic, which is probably the best brand they had. They sold off the rest of the brands and kept City Chic. And um, on the day that actually happened, we did the work, realized that you're buying the best company, um, and they were actually getting cash in for businesses that were losing money. So they sold off five brands, things like Rivers, um, Miller's Retail, these, these, these sort of brands that collectively had a lot of lease liability, were losing money, and they sold that for $25 million, got cash in the balance sheet, and what remained was City Chic, which is a, um, a fashion retailer for plus-size women. And um, it had been experiencing very good growth under the management team there. So, we bought that stock at about six times EBIT. Again, net cash balance sheet, change in management team, um, and that stock's had a tremendous rating from about 65, 70 cents we bought it to. Currently, it's trading about $2.70. Um, and something like 40% of the revenue comes from online. So they're, they're a real world retailer, but they sell a lot of product online in the US and, and Europe. And then another stock which I'm very excited about right now is, um, is Blackmores, which um, I'm sure many of you will know. It's been around in Australia for a very long period of time. They sell, obviously, health supplements. And um, again, you can see that the, the, the key traits we're looking for. On the left-hand side, cash, cash flow conversion over a very long period of time has been 
you know, 73%, it's not remarkable, but it's, it's certainly not bad. Um, and you can see, interestingly, with the history of Blackmores, you've had that, you had that incredible run up, there's my little dot, um, when the Chinese, the Daigus, discovered Blackmores as they did with A2 and Bellamy's and these other consumer goods companies in Australia. Um, and the stock had a great growth in sales. Unfortunately, they also massively increased their cost base. Um, with consumer goods companies, if you have a revenue growth of, say, you know, 5 to 10%, which is pretty solid, you normally get good operating leverage. In other words, so your, your EBIT or your earnings should be growing at least in line with your revenue, prob probably better. Uh, and these guys managed to <laughs> increase their cost base at or greater than their sales, revenue, their sales base. So whilst it's a great business, a cracking brand, they really have failed to execute, um, especially with their expansion to China. Um, what's interesting about Blackmores, though, at the moment is that, um, as, as, as you can see on the right-hand side, the margins there sort of peaked up and they came back down again. So operating margins around about 13%. The nearest comp is a company called um, Swiss, which you, again you'll know, which was acquired by a Hong Kong company called Biostein. Their operating margins are around about 30%. So almost three times the level of Blackmores. Now, Blackmores is more conservative. They put more money into their costs, probably spend a bit more money on advertising, but that differential in margins is, just, is extreme. Uh, they've just appointed a new CEO in the form of a guy called Alistair Symington, and we think there's a really good opportunity for him to reduce costs um, and potentially strike up a JV with a partner in China. So lots of opportunity there, and we don't think it's priced for um, any of those sort of um, upsides, potentials. I'm just going to leave you with, um, well, I'm not quite leaving yet, but uh, just give you a quick snapshot of the top 10 holdings in the company, give you some flavor. I mean, you got some idea before with that basket of stocks we own, but we own um, stocks that all generate great cash flow. Um, HTE, which is a media company, it's a radio business, it used to be the old APN business, but it's basically now a radio company, so it owns Kiss FM, um, FM stations all around the country. Um, net cash balance sheet, it's been buying its stock back, it's trading on about seven times EBIT. Um, people think radio is being disrupted, but it's probably the least disruptable um, media we think at the moment. Uh, GBST, which is under takeover, Blackmores, Bega, Fletcher Building, so many of the names you'll know. Um, stocks that we think are basically representing incredibly good value right now, given, um, given they've been left behind a little bit. And in, in at least half the cases, they're the balance sheets and their cash. And the rest of the ones that have, have gearing are basically pretty, pretty modestly geared companies. So again, that focus on safety and downside protection as well as looking for, for decent upside with valuation support. What's our outlook for the marketplace? Um, small companies we think are, well, offering reasonable value and especially the bottom end, so the micro cap end, which as I showed you before, lagged a little bit. We think there's, despite the fact that that gap's closed a bit, we think there's still some really, really good opportunities in microcaps. Um, and we think that we're starting to see some corporate activity down there. So private equity has moved down there and, and a few corporates are coming into that space to take over stocks. Um, so we think we'll be the beneficiary of that, of that pr price discovery. We focus on cash flow businesses, as I said to you. All the reasons you understand, we can value cash flow. Cash flow can pay dividends. Cash flow can reduce debt. Um, we look for low, low gear balance sheets, and most importantly, we do focus on valuations, which I think will come back into vogue at some stage, and certainly the last few months are showing that valuations do matter, and if you buy stocks at any price with any kind of growth behind them without any, without any reference to valuation eventually, um, that, will, that will see you undone. And then lastly, um, economic sensitive stocks, so stocks that are exposed to the housing cycle, um, the retail cycle, for example, which got sold off pretty badly over the last 12 months on the back of the housing market coming back, have started to show some life again with you know, the housing starts improving and the housing prices pick up, picking up a little bit. Now just to finish off, we are, um, as I said before, the stock is trading at about $1.68, $1.70. The, the last published NTA pre-tax was $2.03, so we're trading at about a 14% discount to, to the NTA of the shares. What are we doing to kind of close that gap? Well, one, we're doing these kind of events, trying to improve our communication with investors. We, we publish um, monthly reports explaining what we're doing, what we hold. Uh, we have uh, webinars like this. We do webinars on, online. Um, we're also publishing weekly NTA, which shows you exactly where the, the fund's value is. Um, and finally, we're doing a buyback. So we're doing about a 4% buyback of a company. So roughly $5 million is being used to buy back the stock at, at, at its current discount to NTA. So that is actually modestly accretive to, to shareholders who remain in the, in the fund. As I said, we're paying dividends every two, every six months. Um, the yields currently backward looking is about three and a half percent, fully franked. Um, but that obviously grows in line with the earnings and the dividend yields we get from, from the companies that we're, we're investing in. And then finally, you know, the, the team owns a reasonable chunk of the stock and has actually been buying more shares recently. So that's pretty much wraps up the LIC and Sferia. Thank you. Thank you.